Hi everyone, it's Ray Gaucher back with you once again. Welcome to another edition of After God's Own Heart. And welcome to part three of my mini-series, A New Beginning with Yeshua. And the title of this video, Understanding God's Love. Now, before we can even establish a relationship with God, we need to understand His love. We need to understand how wonderful He is, how much He cares for us. Um, that God is not a being in heaven with no emotions at all. He's not just up there, the fierce God who sends lightning bolts down and He sits on His throne with His staff um, saying, don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and punishment, punishment, punishment. That's not the way God is. Oh, but He will. He will bring judgment on this world. He will. However, He's a loving, caring God with many emotions. In the beginning in Genesis, where God said, let us make man in our own image. If you feel fear, happiness, joy, if you cry, these are all the same emotions that God possesses. He has all the same emotions. We've seen it as well in, in the Gospels when Jesus wept many times. He got angry when he was in the temple, when they were selling stuff in the temple and totally mocking God's house, the house of God. We've seen Jesus weep when just before he raised Lazarus from the dead, uh, when he was with his apostles. Uh, we've seen him with tons of anxiety um, when he was in the garden, just before his crucifixion. God possesses every single emotion that you and I feel, especially love. He's I mean, he, he feels anger, uh, repentance, uh, of course, yeah, which would mean he's, sor he, you know, he's sorry, he's sorrowful. Um, he also shows uh, feelings of joy and happiness, and he weeps. God, God does weep. You may not think he does, but he does. When he sees his children down here, um, turning away from him and not wanting anything to do with him. Think of somebody that you really, really love. Think of somebody that you've ever really, truly loved in your life and you just wanted to give so much to them and they just turned you away. They just didn't want nothing to do with you. And you just felt so grieved inside and felt so hurt and maybe you even cried. That's how God feels when we want to, or should I say, when He wants to give us what he's offering and we turn it away we we say no we don't want it and I'll give you an example when we were kids look how excited we got during Christmas time when we knew we were gonna get presents and it was an exciting time and that's why they say it's more exciting to give than it is to receive uh, there's plenty of times in my life where I've given things to people and I just had more excitement on doing it or more excitement about buying something for somebody and then seeing the expression and the excitement on their face when they actually opened it up or when they actually received it. And it's the same thing with God. He wants to give us a good life. I'm not saying that we're not going to go through trials, we're not going to go through tribulation, we're not going to go through temptation, but He's going to get us through it. But he wants us, he wants to just give us a relationship with him that we trust him with all our heart. And this one way of understanding God's love, he is so forgiving. Think of the worst person you can think of on this planet. I don't know who it would be. The worst possible crime. Even somebody who was, uh, even a child molester somebody would, that would do something like that to an innocent child. But if that person acknowledged his faults, acknowledged his sin, went to God with his whole heart and confessed it and repented of it, God would forgive him. He would forgive him of his past sin. He would forgive him of his present sin. He would forgive him of his future sin. He would forgive him. And when he says, the Bible says that when God forgives us of our sin, it's forgotten. It doesn't bring it up. There's nothing worse than having somebody in your life when you confess something to somebody or say, I'm sorry, I did this, and they keep bringing it up and keep bringing it up and keep bringing it up. It's like, well, did you forgive me for it or not? 
God's not like that. He's, he, he forgives us of our sin. He just totally forgives us when we ask for it. And, we're, and we mean it with our heart. We can see plenty of examples in the Bible of God's unfailing love. One of them is in the story, uh, the story of Joseph in Genesis, and I think it's chapter 34 where it starts, um, where Joseph is sold into slavery. If you're not familiar with the story, um, I'm not going to go into all the details, but um, Joseph is uh, a son of Jacob, and his brothers become very jealous of Joseph because Jacob clearly favors him. And because Joseph had a dream that he was going to become bigger than them, they just got more and more jealous. They eventually sold him to some passerbyers. He ended up in Egypt as a slave, but God elevated him wherever he went. It's, it's a really fascinating story. Uh, you have to read it. So it's in Genesis, um, like I said, I think it's chapter 34, something like that, where it starts, or uh, chapter 38, where he's sold into slavery. But one of the examples I wanted to share with you, of we see examples of God's love in people because we are His church. We are um, the body of Christ. If you've ever come across somebody who is just the most compassionate, loving person and they're, and they're a Christian and you can just see Jesus in them by how they treat you, their... Um, they're generous. They're um, they pray for you. Um, they treat you good all the time. They 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 never have a, a bad thing to say about you, and they always say something positive. And they just show just an amazing love in their heart. And we see these examples in ministries that help out homeless children. We see these in ministries for needy children, needy people around the world. These some of these ministries that raise money for um, uh, a lot of these foreign countries. A lot of them are legit, some of them aren't, but we can just see God's love in the body of Christ. And you can really see God's love in Joseph here, because Joseph had every single right to be angry with his brothers because of what they did. They threw him into a pit. I don't know how long he was sitting there, and they were actually going to kill him. But then they chose and said, we don't want his blood on our hands. So they sold him instead. He ends up in Egypt. He ends up being a slave to some guy. But this, but God elevated him wherever he went. So Joseph ended up being the head of his house. And then the guy's wife hit on Joseph. Joseph said, no, I'm not going to do this against my God and my master, which was the guy that owned the home. So his, the guy's wife accused Joseph of trying to hit on her. He ends up in jail for two years, but Joseph still did not lose his faith. And then while he's in jail, God elevated him to one of the head guys in the jail. And the story goes on. Um, but when it, what ends up happening is that Pharaoh ends up having a dream, and he's not nobody can tell him what, what, what the interpretation is. And then one of the guys, uh, his cupbearer, who was in prison at the time, received a revelation from, or interpretation from one of his dreams from Joseph. And Joseph says, this is, you're going to be, you know, restored and you will, you will be by the king's side again. And Joseph says, well, please remember me when you, when you were back out there. But the guy forgot about Joseph. I don't know how, but the, two years later, because he was in jail for two years, uh, the king had this dream. And um, the king couldn't find anybody to interpret it for him give him the interpretation for it. And then the cupbearer remembers, oh, wait a minute, I know a guy, Joseph, he's in prison. He told me what my dream meant and it all came true. So the king brought him out. Joseph more or less told the king, the interpretation of your dream is gonna be seven years of plenty and there's gonna be seven years of famine. And because Joseph was so wise in that, in that, in that king's, or in Pharaoh's eyes, that he made Joseph the second in charge of all of Egypt, which is amazing. God just totally blessed this man. And a lot of it was because he did not lose his faith. He trusted in God. So um, so that, that that's pretty well the story. But I wanted to read a little bit for you here because this shows really God's love just in this one example here. 
Then Joseph couldn't, okay. Now, his brothers, during the, the, the seven years of plenty happened, they started to gather all the wheat and everything. This is what Joseph was in charge of doing, preparing Egypt for this famine that was coming. So they collected wheat, they collected produce, they collected everything to make sure they had more than enough to take care of the people in the land during the seven years, um, uh, the drought that was going to happen. And um, so Joseph's brothers end up coming into Egypt to buy food because of the famine, because of what happened. And they ended up going to Joseph. And Joseph recognized them, but they didn't recognize Joseph. And I'm guessing because the Egyptians, they, had, they, they did a lot of paint, they wore certain things, they probably didn't recognize Joseph. But Joseph recognized them. So he was playing around with them a little bit too, sending them back and forth. But eventually, when he, he I guess he couldn't really restrain himself anymore. He, his love was burning so much for his brothers. He had so much compassion for his brothers because he knew, Joseph knew, that God brought him into Egypt for a purpose so he could do exactly what he's doing to preserve the lives of his father and his, and his brothers and, and other people that were in the area you know, the, uh, the Israelites and of course, well, the Israelites, which, which means whoever was traveling with Jacob and his brothers, probably quite a bit of people. So God had, that was God's purpose, to preserve their lives. Um, so while his brothers were in Egypt, visiting Joseph, Joseph brings him into their house, into his house, and now he, he just can't, you know, he, he couldn't restrain himself anymore. He needed to reveal who he was to his brothers. Now, again, Joseph could have threw them all into prison. He could have had them all killed because of what they because of what they did. But because of God's unfailing love in his heart, this is what he does instead. It says, and this is chapter 45, Genesis, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make every, everyone go, go from me. That's probably his servants, his Egyptian servants, and whoever, housemaids or whoever was there. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept aloud. He wept. This is a man with an incredible, affectionate, loving heart. And I can relate to that. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to say I can relate to that. And he wept out aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. He must have been crying pretty loud if they heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. That's amazing. We're going to skip over to verse 14. Then he fell on his brother's brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after his brothers talked and after that his brothers talked with him. He had every reason in the world to be angry with his brothers. And what does he do instead? He, he wept. He forgave them. He had a forgiving heart. Because he just, that because of God's love within his heart, uh, God's unfailing agape love that was with, within Joseph. There was not a um, resentful bone in his whole body. And uh, this, is a, this, this is a wonderful example if you want to, try to be like somebody. This is one man who I I would love to be like Joseph. He spent time in Egypt where he was a slave, two years in prison, falsely accused. Uh, who knows what fears he might have been going through. And that of all of this, he hugs his brothers and forgives them and weeps over them. That's an amazing heart. That is an example of God's love. Now, if you really want to see a, an example of God's love, just think how exciting it is for us to give to someone else. 
God gets just as excited when we come to Him and we trust Him and we ask His Holy Spirit to grow in us and for us to understand God's love and for us to grow closer to Him. When we take time in our prayer closets and spend time with Him, it brings Him joy and He shares His love with us. Now, if our parents got that excited about buying presents for us, how much more exciting, how much more excited is God when He wants to give to us and we receive it and then there's times where God will be sad out of so many people on this earth. He's opening his arms and he's going, please come to me children, come to me. I wanna give you life. I wanna give you eternal happiness. I wanna give you salvation. I don't want you to perish. He weeps and then people will say, no, I'd rather watch TV. No, I'd rather live in sin. I'd rather go live with my boyfriend or girlfriend. No, I'd rather do this. I, I don't want it, Lord. Maybe when I'm on my deathbed, I'll come to you. But God's not foolish. He grieves and he weeps when we reject him. If there's anyone you've ever, ever truly loved, I mean really loved in your life, and they've turned you away or they've rejected you. And a lot of us have experienced this with our parents. A lot of us have experienced this with friends, in marriages. It's heartbreaking. It's terribly heartbreaking. Well, you can just imagine how much more that is for God because the Bible says he doesn't want anyone to perish, nobody. He loves me just as much as he loves um, a man out there that's dealing child pornography. He wants that man to come to repentance. And if he comes to repentance and asks for forgiveness of his sins and turns his way to God, he will forgive that person of all their sin. That's how loving he is. I can't even fathom that. Try doing that. Try having unconditional love for everybody that you know. It's really hard, especially people that have wronged you. God's love for us is endless. It's endless. And if you think you have a tremendous sin in your life or you've gone beyond forgiveness, you need to think again on that. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? If you guys have ever read the story about Sodom and Gomorrah. And God was asked, just before he was going to send his angels to destroy those cities, God was asked, if you find 50 righteous, if there's 50 righteous men in, the, in that city, will you destroy it? And God says, no, if I find 50 righteous men, I will not destroy it. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah was probably the worst you could possibly think of. Um, when the two angels came to Sodom to warn Lot and his family to get out, they were almost attacked by the people in, 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 in the city. Everyone came out, young and old and probably women, everybody came out. And they said, let us see these two new men that have come so we may know them. They wanted to gang rape these men. This was a really corrupt, filthy city, and God just didn't want nothing more to do with it. It's the worst you could possibly think of. But God was still compassionate. He was still loving and compassionate. And he was asked, if I can find 50 righteous men in the city, will you destroy it? And he says, no. No, I won't if you find 50 righteous men. And then he's asked, well, if, you, if, if, if there are 45 righteous men in that city, will you destroy it? And God said, if there's 45, I will not destroy it. And then he went from 40 to 30 to 20 and even down to 10. If you, if, if I can find 10 righteous men, will you destroy it? And God's like, if you find 10 righteous men, I will not destroy it. 
God was willing to spare that city if there was even 10 righteous people in that city. And I don't know how many people were in those cities. Could have been 100,000, I don't know. But that's sad. But God was so forgiving and loving that if you could find 10 people in that whole city, that's righteous, that's not corrupt, I'll save it. But God knew there wasn't. Lot's family was it. Five people. See, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with brimstone. And, uh, but that's another example of God's love. These two cities were so corrupt, but he was still willing to, to, to save, save, from just, save them from destruction if they could find at least ten righteous men, and they couldn't. I myself have experienced how wonderful God's love is. I can't tell you how many times in my life I have felt his presence, I have felt him calling me, and then I turn away and do something else. Several years, get involved with something and not even really even communicate with God at all. And then I can feel this tugging in my heart. He's like, Ray, I love you. Won't you come back? It's like the story of the prodigal son, when the son tells his dad, I want half of my inheritance. I want to move on. I want to go have a good time. His father gives him his half of the inheritance. His son goes, spends it on harlots, spends it on gambling, probably drink, ends up working at a pig farm. And then he came to his senses and realized, I'd rather be at home with my father sleeping with the cattle. It's better than this. He realized what he had done. He did not know that his father was going to forgive him. But he'd rather be home with the servants, living with the servants, than in his father's house because he did not know if his father would forgive him. But as he was on his way home, his father was halfway up the drive area, driveway, whatever it is, waiting for his son to come home. And when his son approached him, his dad ran up and hugged him and kissed him and said, bring your best shoes, bring your best clothes, put a ring on his finger, let's get the fatted calf, let's celebrate because my son has come back. He was lost and he's now found. And I can just imagine that son, he was probably just like, what? You're not going to discipline me. You're not going to be mad at me. You're not going to be angry with me. But his father was so happy to see that his son had come home. And that he, that he was coming back. To re he was repenting. It's a beautiful story. And that's the way God is. If we fall short or if we make mistakes in life and we walk away from God... He's not up there ready to throw lightning bolts down at us and throw judgment on us. He will allow things to happen to us to get our attention. He will bring trials into our life to get our attention. And He only does this because He loves us. If you've ever strayed away from God and you notice things are going really bad, but you still feel like calling on you, or if you've sinned, if you're a follower and you've sinned, and you, and you start feeling these trials come on. It's not because God's punishing you. It's because he's, he's chastening you. He's molding you. He's trying to get your attention. Because he loves you. He does not want you to perish. I can't think of anything in the world that's got more love than a God that is willing to put us through a trial like that so we can learn something from it. it you know what? Don't think for a minute God's up there with full satisfaction when he sees us going through a trial, when we're going through a trial, when we're going through the storm, when we're going through the desert. Don't think God's up there going, good. That's not what he's doing. It's like a child. They keep sticking their finger in a light socket or, or into a socket. They're going to keep getting electrocuted. And in the olden days, they, of course, nowadays you get thrown into jail, but you spank that kid on the bottom to teach them a lesson. Don't do that again. Try to teach them some discipline. 
It breaks our heart to do that, to hear them cry. But we know it's for their better. We know it's for their good. And that's the same thing it is with God. When we go through these trials and he sees us cry, he sees us weep, it breaks his heart. He doesn't want us, he wants, he wants us to be joyful and happy. But he knows it's for our own good. And when we come out of that, we're stronger and wiser. And the chances of us making that same mistake are a lot less. So let me conclude by saying God's love for you is endless. And if you're going through a trial, he feels your pain. Just hold on. Just hold on to, to hold on to your faith. Trust in him and acknowledge how wonderful loving God is. And if you want to experience God's love, if you really, really want to truly experience it, ask him for it. He will never turn us down if we ask. Lord, please help me to draw closer to you. Let me pray. Father God, I just want to thank you for sending your precious son to die for us on the cross. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would bless everybody right now that's watching this video. I pray that you would reveal your unconditional love to everyone that's watching this video. Show them, reveal yourself to them, O oh Lord, those that are willing, how wonderful your heart is and how much you love them and how forgiving you are. I pray that you would bless everyone that's watching this video and that you would help everyone that's, that's viewing this right now get through whatever trial they're going through right now, that they will find the healing in their lives that they need healing over. And I pray, O oh Lord God, that this video would bless each and every person that's watching right now. Be with them, O oh Lord. And again, I pray that you would just stir their hearts, that they would search and have a hunger for righteousness, and that they would truly experience your true, wonderful love. In Yeshua's name I pray, amen. All right. That's all I got for you this time. Part four. It'll, it'll be coming up. This is what the Lord puts on my heart. <laughs> God bless all of you in the name of Yahshua. Bye for now.